Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a great honor to, to be able to, to be here and wish uh, Maxime a happy birthday. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so um, uh, well, what I'd like to talk about today, well, I'd like to say, I mean, uh, Maxime, as you all have known and said uh, many times so far, has been at the origin of a, of a, a number of conceptual rev revolutions, I think. Um, in, in a lot of different subjects, in fact. Um, and what I'd like to talk about today is, is you know, another one of these examples um, on the subject of, of basically character varieties, or spaces of representations. So, um, So you know the space of representations. Uh, so so let's let x over c be a, basically a curve. Uh, um, Maxim keeps asking me, you know, what about higher dimensional case? But okay, let's uh, uh, for these questions, the, the, these questions are already uh, uh, mostly happening for curves, uh, and we don't really know what to say further. I don't think for higher dimensions yet. Um, Anyway, so let's let X, let's like a, take a curve, and so we should think of it as basically being either a compact curve or some kind of open curve, but we go, keep some control over what's happening at the puncture points and so on. Um, and as I think many of you know, uh, uh, an important part of what's going on is uh, also happens for irregular connections and stuff like that. But I'm maybe not going to make that much of a distinction uh, for that here. Um, and so the space of representations, let's say into SLN, so let's say R. This is an affine variety. Uh, usually, I mean, called uh, also in, by the topologists call this the character variety. So in particular, it's open, so it's uh, non-compact. And so, uh, so I think there's recently been, uh, uh, you know, some kind of conceptual revolution. And how we can look at the the points at infinity. Unfortunately, I don't actually understand this very well. Um, so, uh, and also I'd like to thank Tom Bridgeland because I think he, in his talk yesterday, he said a lot of things which, uh, which one should say here. Um, so, but le uh, let me just, um, first before getting started, uh, you know, write down some of the people. So obviously Konsevich and Soibelman is, They have a series of papers which are really at the origin, I think, of this. Uh, also, Gyodo Mornitsky. Uh, so, so uh, let me apologize, especially since I'm on film. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, you know, I'm going to be forgetting lots of people here, so I'd like to apologize to all the people who I might forget here, which are uh, numerous, uh, especially, as I said, being on film. Uh, Um, then I uh, then I uh, also like to write you know Bridgeland Smith. Um, then there's also uh, people in uh, which are basically coming from 3D topology or low dimensional topology, uh, uh, and you know other similar types of directions. But for example, which Richard Wentworth. And there's a whole group of people uh, uh, working, uh, uh, roughly speaking, around Francois Labouille. 
uh, maybe I'll say Lofton, uh, and other people working with them. Uh, Uh, Ian Lee, uh, for example, um, and uh, well, th their work is based on stuff which we're, we're actually we've actually been using a lot, which is a work by Perot. Uh, and Perot, I think, was working with uh, Frederic Poulin uh, using Kleiner Lieb theory. And this, this whole thing is actually al also goes back to Morgan Shalen convectifications and so on. Uh, and also, to, I'd also like to men mention Thomas Hausel uh, and his uh, co-workers, Rodriguez Villegas. Uh, L'Etelier. Uh, and so on. And then there's also a, a number of recent people, which I'm sorry I don't know. Uh, uh, for example, uh, Tom mentioned in his talk a certain number of people, uh, Ikeda and some other people. Uh, and but there's also there's been several different recent preprints on archive. Uh, I'm sorry I don't just ha I just didn't you know collect all this information. Um, and, I'll, and I'd also like to say that you know what, uh, what I'll be talking about here, aside from the, the sort of global picture, which is maybe older, uh, but the, the the actual you know theorems and, or uh, observations, theorems, conjectures, and stuff like that are are joint work with with Lune Mill, uh, uh, Alex uh, Noel. And Pond of Pondit. And uh, I'd also like to say, I mean, um, the, there's, uh, this was on some visits to Vienna. So there's also a number of other people in the group in Vienna, uh, which we were discussing these things with. Uh, and I think we should particularly put uh, Fabian Haydn, uh, who, who, who was helping some discussion. Uh, um, Okay, and we have a preprint on archive, so that can, where for I'll, I'll be trying to draw some pictures here, but uh, you, you can also see the much better versions of the pictures in on, in the preprint. Um, okay, so uh, let me just get started. So to get started, I just like to draw some pictures. With, these are not the pictures uh, in the preprint, but uh, just like to like draw the sort of a global picture of the the structure. That you have on moduli spaces of representation. So let's sort of put that over here. So I'd like to make a box, but let's instead of making a box, I'll just leave this top open. Okay. So so the, this box is representation. Okay. The next box is. Uh, connections. More precisely, vector bundles with integrable holomorphic connection. Okay. Uh, the next box, which I'll put over here, is Higgs bundle. Um, now I'd like to connect these together a little bit. Um, so this is the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. And here, well, we have the, the, the solutions of the Hitchin equations, which give the, the correspondence here. But in fact, what I'd like to draw here is actually more uh, the moduli space of lambda connections. Let's draw it this way. Okay, so we sort of have a coordinate here, which is lambda. So, uh, so let me put in quotes that lambda is sort of equal to h bar. But I'm not really sure. I mean, you guys know this much better than I do. Uh, sometimes people put an h bar in here, and I guess this the lambda coordinate is 
often somewhat related to h bar as it occurs in, you know, in quantum mechanics. I'm not sure whether it's really reasonable to think that uh, this parameter lambda, which is kind of a universal parameter that's showing up in math, whether this is really equal to h bar or is it just that it plays a similar role in some cases? Um, and so this is lambda equal zero, and this is lambda equal one. We have a GM action on the space of lambda connections which scales lambda, and that's why I'm drawing these like this. But the images of the orbits here, the, the images of the points here, their orbits all go to the, to the sort of ground level state in Higgs bundles, which, are, which is the nilpotent cone. And so, so let me, I left, left a little bit of room here for the Hitchin map. The Hitchin map maps, uh, maps the moduli space of Higgs bundles to a vector space. OK, so let's just call this A, A n. I would call it, I guess you, know, you can call it B as the hit base of the Hitchin vibration. Uh, B is going to show up a little later for a different thing. So, um, and this map is proper. And for example, uh, these guys go to zero. The, the nilpotent cone here is, a, is just the fiber over zero in the Hitchin map. Um, whereas the, uh, this space is affine. Um, so let me just say with respect to, um, to what Richard was saying in the previous talk, I gather that this is a little bit of, a, of an analogy which is considered by, by you guys, uh, maybe, <laughs> um, which is the, the, the fact that uh, all through, uh, these are, this is a complex analytic isomorphism. So if you have an affine variety, it can't actually have any uh, compact subvariety. And that's preserved over to here because it's just the same complex analytic subvariety. So, so up until here, there's no compact subvarieties. So I gather that there's a little bit of an analogy with this uh, transversal section to the algebraic, to the nodal left edge locus that, that Richard was talking about, in the sense that here we have uh, something where, which has a lot of compact subvarieties because, in fact, it has a proper map, so all the fibers are compact subvarieties. But it sort of deforms to a guy which has no compact subvariety. Um, the you know, the nearby fiber here is just the same as as this space. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what to do with that further. But um, I think that's a an analogy which you need to take into consideration here. Okay. So so well, the fact that this is an affine variety means that we have uh, that that it's open. That's why I left this open up here. Um, and so we can link, think of trying to compactify. Okay, now what's the compactification going to look like? So I'll draw this. Uh, this is actually an example which you can actually calculate. Um, the only one which I know how to actually calculate. Uh, in an example, the compactification looks something like this, for example. So the compactification, uh, as a, say, with a normal crossings divisor, is going to have a lot of different components, and they're going to meet in subcomponents and so on. Okay. Whereas on this side, we can also compactify, but in a different way. So in the moduli space of Higgs bundles, we have a C star action. This is the trace on the fiber lambda equals 0 of the C star action, which trivializes the rest of the space of lambda connections. And so we can just take, throw out this, this piece and divide everybody else by C star. So we can just add at infinity here a guy which is just the quotient of everything except the bottom here by the action of C star. Okay. Um, if you think about it a little bit, that's actually not a, it's a smooth, I mean, if, if this space is smooth, which it happens in many cases, then that's mo basically going to be a smooth divisor. Uh, it's not actually exactly smooth because it has some orbital fold points. The orbifold points are actually interesting too, because they correspond to, to Higgs bundles, which are preserved, which are invariant by some finite subgroup of C star. Uh, and those include things called cyclic Higgs bundles, which are uh, being used by some people now. Um, 
But if you think of it as an orbifold compactification, then the, the divisor here is actually smooth. Okay, and this just goes to the, sorry, to the sort of pn minus one at infinity of this affine space. Uh, maybe yeah, that's cheating a little bit. Uh, this affine space actually has a, the, the action of C star is actually weighted here. So uh, this is sort of a weighted, maybe, projective space. Um, now it turns out that, the, that you can use this picture here to get the same compact, kind of compactification here. In fact, the compactification has exactly the same divisor. So these guys are the same. Which is to say, uh, uh, the, the points here are just, again, points in the space uh, here up to C star invariance. And we can actually see how, how that works as follows. So if we choose a point out here which is not on the Dilbotin cone, then we take a section going out to this point. Then we translate this section back by the, by the C star action. So you can see what's going to happen here from this picture. Uh, when you start translating back this section to here, you're going to get a curve which goes out to infinity. Okay. Maybe y'all. Do we have some color? Let's sort of shade it as, as, as it, it gets closer and closer to infinity. And that's. Uh, corresponds to the shading here by uh, going out to here. And so not, not only do we get a curve here, but we actually get a parameter too. Let me call this parameter t, which is basically 1 over lambda. So if we're calling lambda h bar, it's you know, 1 over h bar. Well, that's in quotes. So a point, so a point at infinity. If we think we, we can think of a point at infinity here, on this divisor, as being a point in the moduli space of Higgs bundles, and going towards that point uh, inside here corresponds to just going towards this point, sort of horizontally, in the moduli space of lambda connections. So from that, I mean, yeah, of course, you have to do the the geometrical argument, but from that, you can see that the divisor is going to be just the same here and here. So from this point of view, uh, we'd like to think of the behavior at infinity in these two different spaces as being, roughly speaking, the same. That, that's an, obviously a vast over, oversimplification. Um, but uh, we can think of it as being, roughly speaking, the same. Okay. Now, I'd like to draw, furthermore, a sort of a cylinder around this guy. So let's think of taking a neighborhood of infinity. Now, the cylinder over this guy is going to go to you know, a neighborhood of infinity in the, in the Hitchin base. So let me just say my, my picture is actually, I'm actually drawing the picture in the case where this is A1. It's just the affine law 1. So for the picture, this is actually a disk, OK? So I don't really want to. Let's think of the projective line as being sort of in the middle of the disk. Um, in any case, the, the, the boundary of this neighborhood at infinity is actually going to be a sphere. Uh, it's a sphere with a kind of hop vibration to pn minus 1 in the general case. It's just a circle in the case of a, well, the base has dimension 1. And again, this picture is also the, a picture. Th th this is actually a relatively accurate picture in this case of uh, where the base, ha where the Hitchin base has dimension one, where the spaces have dimension two, complex dimension two. Um, and it turns out that this is uh, I learned this in a paper from Goldman and Toledo. Uh, this is a triangle in a cubic surface. Um, okay. So that's a cl very classical thing, Fricke Klein or something like that. But if we think of taking the neighborhood of the of this guy here, 
It doesn't look a lot like the neighborhood here, but actually the point is that if you think about it a little bit, it really does look a lot like this neighborhood in the sense that here we have, a, if we look at this configuration of, uh, of divisors in infinity, we see a circle. Okay? If we look over here, we also see a circle. Okay? So just from this picture, you can see that you know, what's probably happening here is that that circle there is going to go to this circle here. So uh, when you go once around a point in a really a little disk, uh, uh, in this picture, you're going around an entire divisor of stuff over here. And, um... Carlos, for SO2, there's a certain bound of the Tachmer space. Is that what you put on there, or...? Where, where? Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm going to be getting to that, uh... I mean, uh, getting to say something more, uh, somewhat closer to that. Uh, before getting there, let me just say a couple of things. So one is that we can conjecture that, uh... We can conjecture that the that the incidence complex of the divisor at infinity in the character the the divisor at infinity at the character variety is a sphere and that the correspondence, this maps by some kind of homotopy equivalence to the sphere at infinity in the Hitchin base. Okay. So Maxime keeps telling me that he, this is actually a theorem. Okay. So I'm not quite sure what the hypotheses of the theorem version of the statement are. Um, <laughs> but in any case, I, I think, uh, and, and it's, it's stated in a phrase, and uh, Jan pointed out, it's stated in a phrase in their paper, um, at least something like this. Uh, there's also a theorem which says something a little bit like that in a paper by Richard Wentworth, I think. Um, and I think that, you know, um, uh, what you said about the Thurston boundary and so on uh, is fairly close to this. Um, this conjecture is only just motivated really by this picture, in fact. In the case when you have a triangle for the representation, it's the boundary. It's yeah, so, so if you think, uh, okay, we can think about this a little bit more clearly, but uh, how are you doing for time? Um, you, you, can, you can make this correspondence a little bit more, a little bit more uh, precise in this case, in just in this example, which is that if you think about um, when that one's a triangle, what's the boundary of the middle one, the one of the connections? Well, as I said, this, this is pretty much the same as this guy, I mean, roughly speaking. Multiple P1 or what? Well, no. no. Oh, connections. Well, OK, so the, the point is, uh, in, in the Hitchin moduli space, the fibers, uh, the fibers of uh, this map are elliptic curves in the, in the two-dimensional case. Yeah. So we're going to have these, uh, but in general, the general fiber is in an abelian variety in any case. So the fiber is basically going to be some, let's call it abelian variety, some kind of Jacobian. So in fact, it's more of a, a prim or something. Okay. But it's a torus, OK? It's a, it's a complex torus. But in this one-dimensional case, there's no problems with discriminant loci. And in fact, it's always the same elliptic curve. And indeed, when you go once around, that does a minus one on that elliptic curve. I was telling you that yesterday, actually. When you go around here once, that does a minus one on this elliptic curve. Okay. And on the, now, if you look over here, the fiber of, is it, think of squishing the, the neighborhood of these three lines to the lines themselves. Okay. The neighborhood of a point here is, you know, it's a delta star across delta star, basically. So homotopically, you know, the homotopically the punctured the, the corner neighborhood of the poly disk that goes around this point is S1 cross S1. And that's gonna correspond to the elliptic curve, in fact. And what about pieces inside here? Pieces inside here, you have to remember that this line is actually a P1. So between these two points, we have a GM. So there's already a one-dimensional circle direction there, and then there's the other dimensional circle direction of the of the neighborhood of the of the disk. 
So those sort of combine together to again make an elliptic curve. And you can sort of see in this example that this sort whole thing follows around. And if you follow along these coordinates, you exactly get a minus 1 also on the torus. If you identify tori, 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 uh, you, you, you get minus 1. I mean, something like. I forget why I didn't I didn't do this calculation. You have to do this calculation. There's a matrix with three ones, uh, two ones, a minus one, and a zero in it, whose cube is minus one. That, that's going around this guy uh, in, in that example. I didn't want to do too much detail on this example um, for, for uh, several reasons, one of which uh, is that uh, this example is, I think, totally subsumed as a trivial baby case of what uh, uh, Jan, uh, Jan and, and Maxime do. Um, but OK, so well, maybe to, just to continue with the picture a little bit. Um, so we can see here there are some interesting regions, which are the neighborhoods of crossing points. Okay? And some other interesting regions, which are the neighborhoods of things which are not the crossing points. Now, you can actually calculate, uh, again, in this example, you can actually just explicitly calculate with, uh, with the equation. Uh, for certain values. This, is, this example is the case of P1 minus four points with a rank two system and some conjugacy classes at the four points. Um, for sp some special values of the conjugacy classes, you can actually calculate the map uh, and see what happens. What actually happens is that these regions here, which are small regions here, go to entire sectors over here. More precisely, there's three maps. Like There's three uh, walls. So these are really the walls. Uh, then you, let's. sort of look at the pullback of those walls in the cylinder. And it's the regions which are not on the wall here, which correspond to regions like this here. So basically, this, this map from one side to the other has this property that it's exchanging big regions and small regions. Okay? I think that's what I would say, I mean, as, at least as a first epsilon approximation, is really the, the conceptual new conceptual thing which appears in uh, Konsevich Um so they basically have a picture like this in general. And these are the walls of which the wall crossing formula uh, is talking about. Um, so let me just mention here, uh, uh, as far as this is concerned, um, which is that this conjecture can also be viewed as a uh, as a geometric version of the p equals w of the p equals w conjecture of, of Thomas Housel and, and his uh, co-workers. Um, now, how, why, why do we say that? Because basically the, the map from the from the from the, the divisor, the map from the neighborhood of infinity onto just the real incidence graph on this side. Okay. So take the incidence variety and just take a real uh, simplicial complex. Okay. That's the thing which we're conjecturing is a sphere here. So the, uh, that's supposed to go to the map here, which just maps you to the, to the sphere at infinity in the Hitchin base. Okay. So it's some kind of vague uh, statement that's saying sort of, uh, weight stuff because uh, uh, sorry the this map to this real incidence complex sort of corresponds to some top or bottom piece of the weight filtration. Okay. The the map that that induces on cohomology is going to be the the highest or lowest piece of the weight filtration in the cohomology of the maybe of a neighborhood of infinity of the character variety. Whereas this piece uh, this sphere and if you're looking at the sphere and infinity but in the Hitchin base it's clearly the the cohomology class there pulls back to something which is Clearly, somehow are related to the weight, the, to the Lorey uh, structure for this vibration. Okay, and Housel's conjecture is a more precise conjecture, saying relating uh, the Lorey, some Lorey perverse Lorey filtration on this side with the weight filtration on this side. So I don't know, you know, whether you can. I mean, this is only you know a tiny piece of both, both sides, uh, if at all. Um, so I don't know. One could ask, you know, can we really geometrically say that? Uh, the rest of this conjecture corresponds to some geometric picture. 
I think, you know, I think that's probably actually feasible once we really understand the wall crossing picture uh, here, I mean. You might say the, the, uh, maybe wall crossing should actually imply this P equals w, w conjecture or something like that. Um, let's see, so what did I want to say next? So, so this is kind of the global picture here. Um, now, the next thing I'd like to talk about, maybe I'll leave that up here and since the, the tradition here seems to be to use the sideboards. Um, so l let me just leave that up here. Um, uh, now, uh, what I'd like to talk about now is, is uh, well, we, we were just in Vienna. We were just trying to sort of understand uh, this picture and understand the, the relationship with things like stability conditions and stuff like that. Um, oh, yeah, maybe I should say that before. Uh, so, so, you know, as I said, I, I don't really understand this, and I think uh, Tom actually gave a good... Uh, a better discussion than I could here, but uh, but you know what's the kind of uh, zeroth order output of the papers by Konsevich Soibelman says basically that that uh, the Hitchin base should be considered. as corresponding to a space of stability conditions. Uh, this is really more of a philosophical. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, we, you know, we've been working on trying to figure out how to get the category and everything from this picture, which we haven't found yet. But maybe you guys know how to do it. But uh, maybe uh, we didn't see how to prove that. But uh, uh, I mean, in, in in any case, I think. Uh, I'm not sure about it. okay maybe uh, considered as corresponding to or, or is equal to um, the what I'd like to point out uh, the point I'd like to make here is that in fact uh, the idea is that we have these structures uh, so on some kind of stab of D we have a structure of walls. Uh, uh, also, maybe one thing to, to, to say here, which, which Tom said yesterday, is that we have to, we have to integrate this whole thing over the, very, over the family, over the moduli space of curves, okay? We're not supposed to just fix a single curve, but we're supposed to put those in together in a family. Uh, and so, so, uh, so in, certain, in some cases, this is the result in the paper of Bridgeland Smith. Um, it's not necessary. It's for large groups, you add small percentage of parameters in the sense that you're very curved. So the dimension for the space is much larger. So you, you never get the full on the space. Ah, you, ah. you can group larger than the simple. Ah, ah. OK. So you mean there's, uh, there's, there'll be other stability conditions which are not covered by this. Yeah, OK. But in any case, um, in the space of stability conditions, we have some walls. So, in it, so if this guy is sitting inside the space of stability conditions, will, in any case, have walls which are the intersection of the walls into here. So we're going to have some walls. Okay. And these walls are the things which I drew in the example. And the idea is that, is that these should be uh, maybe uh, let's say the walls, maybe let me say the chambers, in fact. The chambers. Should correspond to points in the character variety in the in the compactification of the character variety. So points over here. So so chambers over there should go to points over here, 
and the walls, uh, I gather, are supposed to correspond to P1s, basically. So, uh, um, in general, I, you know, uh, I don't think anybody knows how to write down equations for this in any good way, uh, in general. Maybe there I'm talking about the compact case, case of compact dream on surfaces. In the open case, we have the cluster coordinates, so we can do a little better. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether it's very clear what the higher dimensional pieces look like in here. Maybe, maybe you know. But in any case, what Maxime points out is that, uh, is that we have these P1s, which join together points. So part of the idea, I think, is that on a given P1, there's only going to be two points. Is that accurate? Yeah. Uh, so basically, in, if we look at the stratification that you get from compactifying the space of representations, you'll have some points, which will be the, the, the lowest dimensional strata. Between the points, they'll be connected by some P1s. And those P1s are supposed to correspond to, to co-dimension one, real co-dimension one walls over here. Okay. You know, when we go from here to here, we do half the dimension. So things which are complex dimension one there could well correspond to real co-dimension one pieces here. Um, yeah, so uh, now the, the SL2 case, the case of you know, some kind of character varieties with coefficients in, with, with SL2 coefficients, um, has been uh, treated by a number of people and in lots of different ways. Uh, so it's a, you know, so let's say well treated, among other things, by Bridgeland Smith. Um, and in this case, so this is kind of the, the start of our discussions that we had with, uh, in, in Vienna. Um, in that case, the, the, the Hitchin base is equal to a space of quadratic differentials. Okay. Uh, a quadratic differential Q just corresponds to the spectral curve Y squared equals Q. Uh, in some kind of cotangent bundle of X. Um, And uh, a big role is played, uh, an important role is played by the foliation. Say a real part of Q equals zero. Okay. And this actually goes back to, to Thurston theory and so on. Uh, let me just explain, maybe, so, um, so underlying this situation, there's something called a WKB question. So we can draw the WKB question here, basically. So here I drew a curve, here I took a horizontal curve going out to a point in the space of Higgs bundles. If we translate that back into this picture, we get um, a nice algebraic curve in the moduli space of connections which goes out and has a nice transversal structure to the divisor at infinity. And in fact, we have this canonical parameter. So at the divisor at infinity, there's sort of a good way of measuring how close we are to the divisor at infinity. Now, if we, if we take that and look at the monodromy representation, I think this is what corresponds in Tom's talk to the place where he said, OK, let's take a complex projective structure and look at its monodromy. Um, so we look at the monodromy, but here we can just say, let's take a connection and look at its monodromy. Then this is going to give some kind of weird uh, path inside here. Okay. So this is going to give some kind of path, let's call this row of t. And the map, so we have a map from basically c, or some, you know, some neighborhood of infinity of c uh, into T mapping to rho of t. And this is actually what's uh, known as the WKB problem.
And so it turns out that this function has some very nice properties, which I think we could sum up as saying it has, it's a example of, has, it, I mean, it's the example of Voros resurgence. Maybe without writing this down on the board, I can say more precisely. Uh, here we can, uh, even though we don't really know the equations, we can write down some coordinates, the Procesi coordinates, which are just the traces of the representation applied to some group element. And so, so we can think of, I mean, this is an affine variety. We can embed it by some coordinates. If we look at those coordinates as functions of t, then we can take the Laplace transform of those functions of t. The Laplace transform of those functions of t has a very nice analytic continuation property. And that's, that's Voros resurgence, basically. Um, so, so this is a very exponential kind of a curve. But uh, it does have some, some sort of hidden regularity problem, pr properties. Um, and what Gaiotto and Mornitsky say is that uh, they analyze. And what's the curve in the, in the connections? You're just scaling the connection? Yeah. We're taking a curve here. So, so we can be, uh, I can be more precise about this. I mean, uh, let's say a typical example. Let me write that down here. A typical example of, of the connection is you know, uh, E. Say VT is just a, say, a, a trivial bundle. Nabla T is equal to D plus uh, some So let's take a, you know, some kind of initial connection where if we take the trivial bundle here and we just add a diagonal thing here, well, OK. Uh, let's Let's not have the trivial bundle, just some bundle. Okay. Let's just choose some connection nabla zero on the bundle E, and then we add a multiple of the Higgs field. Okay. So E. So the, the limit over here is E E phi. This is one t one typical example. I mean, there's different ways of. If you've got a point here, there's you know, di different ways of getting a section, horizontal section that goes out to that point. But roughly speaking, we expect that the behavior over there is sort of the same. Um, that's going to give you a number of different ways of having a family here that approach this point at infinity here. One sort of the easiest conceptually, uh, e conceptually easiest way, way to write one down is to just take a, a bundle. Assume that it, we have a Higgs bundle whose underlying vector bundle admits a connection which is not always true, in fact. But assuming that that's true, then we can just choose some connection, then add a large multiple of some of the Higgs field. So this is what's called singular perturbation, and this is where this WKB thing comes in. We're taking a connection which has the property that, that it has a large algebraic term. Okay. In terms of differential equations, that's what the same thing that you're going to get if you do something like you know, this h bar squared d by dz squared plus, uh, plus the potential. If you, if you, if you turn this guy into, into a matrix form, to a two, two by two matrix form, uh, and then divide by h bar, then you're going to exactly get a one over h bar here, basically. Okay. And so the WKB problem is just, in general, what happens when you have a system of ODEs like that that has a large parameter in it. So then there's the whole question of, I mean, Voros resurgence is sort of ha uh, what happens when you try to do exact WKB approximations. Um, well, so what happens in this SL2 case is the following, which is that um, you can actually say what's going on a lot more clearly for this WKB problem. So the WKB problem. In the SL2 case, which is okay. Um, I'll just draw this picture. We have the foliation defined by the quadratic differential. So, in the in the case of a generic quadratic differential, this foliation is going to have uh, just triple points here, like that. So, these are points where the foliation, where the quadratic differential looks like z dz squared. Okay. Um, now, suppose we have a point here, 
and a point here. And we'd like to calculate the transport for our connection from the point P to the point Q. Okay. Then, am I going to succeed here? Let me do this with color. Then we take a path joining P to Q. If we take a path which is transverse to the, f uh, oh, what's going to happen here? This is not good. If we take a path like that, which is transverse to the foliation, so gamma If we take a path which is transverse to the foliation, then the transport for the connection, so T P Q uh, of T, it's kind of it's row of T applied to a group element. Uh, but you should actually think of it as a, you should look at the fundamental groupoid rather than the fundamental group. So we should look at the transport for the connection going from the point P to the point Q. But the connection depends on T. Uh, then this is going to look basically like uh, E to the uh, some constant times T. And the constant is going to be the length of the path. Transverse to the foliation. Okay, so the the exponent of the of the transport matrix is the the path length transverse to the foliation. This is not true if you take a bad path which is not transverse to the foliation. Uh, if you took a path like this, then. If you try to calculate the length of the path transverse to the foliation, then this real part of Q changes sign as you go uh, past this point. The, you can see from differential equations, you, you're, you're supposed to be taking you know, the absolute value of this guy. Um, but this is going to give you the wrong answer, because we sort of went too far up and then too far back down again. Okay? So this doesn't give you the right answer. It just means that if you try to integrate the, the ODE along this path, it looks like it would have this exponent, which is the length along this path, but actually a whole bunch of stuff is canceling out due to, to moving the path from here to here. Okay, Maybe that's what's called quantum tunneling, possibly. Um, okay, so I uh, should be stopping pretty soon. Um, in, uh, I think uh, all this, this is, you know, I, I'm not an expert on this by any means at all. Um, I think we can say that what's going on in Konsevich Soibom and, and which is now you know this paper of Bridgeland Smith and so on, um, there's this notion of BPS states. And I sort of purposely drew, drew this uh, foliation as to be close to a foliation which is going to have a BPS state. So if you rotate things a little bit, you can see that there's going to be a stage where the leaf the coming out of this singular point equals the leaf going into this singular point. When you go through that stage, then this blue path, you have to sort of change the direction of the blue path as you go across that state. Okay. So our idea was to say that somehow or other the, the geometry, but we don't, we don't know how to make this precise, in fact, but that somehow or other the geometry of the BPS states and so on um, So we'd like to say that the geometry of the BPS states um, corresponds in some way. And this is supposed to be the thing which is governing in some way, which I don't understand, the wall crossing formulas which, uh, which fit into this global picture. Um, but the geometry of the BPS states should correspond to looking at the, the looking at the tree, which is the quotient by the foliation. Which is another way of saying it, it's the space of leaves of the foliation. Okay, so let's call that T. And we have a map, just the projection from X to T. Okay. So this guy is a tree, and it, this map, let's call this H, H is what's known as a harmonic map. Okay. And in fact, it's a harmonic phi map, where phi 
in this case, it's the quadratic differential, but in general, is the, the spectral curve. Just V1. So it's sort of the square elements. In this case, it's just the square root of Q, this quadratic differential. If we take the square root, that's a differential, but it's only defined up to sine. Okay. Um, and the differential, the differential of H is equal to the real part of phi, basically. That's well defined because there's no well defined direction on the tree, uh, just up to plus or minus one. Okay. Now we have a situation where, in this SL2 case, um, the quadratic differential itself leads to this map from x to t. Okay. Let's call this t phi. This tree only depends on the quadratic differential itself. Okay. Now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, universal cover. And uh, this whole thing fits in, which I, you know I don't have time to talk about this too much, but fits into uh, the theory of Perot and so on, which is really going back to the Morgan Shale and compactification, in fact. Uh, which is going to say that if we, if we look at a sequence of connections, then we're going to get a limiting harmonic phi map, uh, x tilde into some tree t so let's call this T omega because it depends on the choice of ultrafilter or something like that. Uh, okay. And this is uh, for the, those of you who might want to look where that is in our paper and, or know what it is yourself or something like that. It's sort of the cone. It's cone omega. It's the asymptotic cone. Uh, underlying here, I mean, again, you'd have to write this down, but uh, as, as many of you know, the underlying, the, especially the, the Hitchin correspondence, uh, uh, there's this notion of harmonic map to a symmetric space. And uh, if you're thinking, oh, can we think of this tree as being the asymptotic tree with, uh, you know, on, on some kind of Gromov boundary of harmonic maps to uh, symmetric spaces, uh, the answer is yes. And in fact, that's the way you get it. And that's what Perot's theory says. Um, so, but now, what's the relationship between this guy and this guy? It's just that this guy has an obvious universal property, which is anytime you have a harmonic phi map from x tilde into anything, into any tree, it obviously has to factor through the space of leaves just because phi is constant on the, you know, the real part of phi is, uh, sorry, the real part of phi is zero on the leaves, so the harmonic map has to be constant on, on the leaves, okay? So this has a universal property like that. So now this is what we wanted to, to look at uh, in the higher rank case. Um, uh, why did we want to look at this? Ba basically for a number of many of these reasons here. Um, notably, I guess the idea is that the stability condition is supposed to somehow they just depend on the choice of point in Hitchin base. So uh, whereas this limiting tree here might might be uh, might depend on more than just the point in the Hitchin base. So we'd like to get a, a structure which only depends on the, the point in the Hitchin base. Um, so so now in our work we've been looking at how to extend this to the case of just SL three. Okay. Uh, so you know SLR or. Oh, we don't actually have anything. Uh, I mean, we don't know what to say here. Uh, uh, no, sorry. I guess the the some parts of the argument work for any for anything. Um, so basically, Perot. Uh, Perot's very nice paper uh, extended to groupoids. Extended in a relatively simple way to groupoids. Yields um, 
the following thing, that if we have a fee, which is a, uh, sorry, if we have a WKB question, so let's say delta t equals delta nabla zero plus t times phi. So if we have a Higgs field phi, and we look at a moduli space of connections, and I, I think this should also work for a more general family uh, where, where the bundle is allowed to vary as a function of t and stuff like that. Um, but we just wrote this down in this case. Yields a construction which corresponds to this situation, uh, limiting and also uh, you have to choose an ultrafilter. Limiting harmonic phi map. So I'm using a, this kind of capital K, capital phi here for the spectral for the Higgs field. This smaller phi is the multi-value differential, which is the spectral curve of the Higgs field. I mean, the values of the differential are just all the different eigenforms of, uh, of capital phi here. And uh, you just get a limiting map to some building. To some kind of R building. And in the SL2, in the SL3 case, this is modeled on the, the apartment system is just R2 with the S3 group of symmetries and so on. But I mean, in general, uh, I think this should work for any kind of group or something like that. Um, you know, in general, you'll get the, the, the apartment system is going to be the one which, uh, which happens for the Bruatitz buildings for that, for that group, basically. Um, so we get a limiting harmonic phi map. That, but that's just kind of a formal thing where, where it, it actually depends on the ultra filter to take the limit and so on. Um, where roughly speaking, the distance, distance from h of p, h of q, is some kind of limit from, it's just that it has to take the ultra filter limit. But it's the limit of 1 over t times the, the log of the absolute value of rho t. So it's, it's, it's basically the scaling factor C here. It's just that we need to take a limit. And uh, you might want to take a limb soup or something like that. If the limit equals the, if the limit exists, then any ultra filter limit is going to be equal to that limit. If it's just a limb soup but not necessarily a limit, which actually happens in, in, in fact, notably at the boundaries uh, along the wall, um, then, the, then the ultra filter limit might be different from, from the limb soup, for example. But you know, it's roughly speaking some good approximation to the WKB exponent. This is just the distance in, the, in this building. Okay, this is just kind of a formal thing, which I think basically sort of puts into, you know, puts into detail what was always kind of a, a hope, I think, ever since uh, the theory of harmonic maps to buildings came about. I mean, the, this is sort of what you think of them as corresponding to in terms of, uh, as related to, say, harmonic maps to symmetric spaces. Um, but then the question is, wh what about, um, let me try this operation here. I should stop. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so then the, um, the statement which we like to show is just that we have a, we have the same universal property. So uh, so but let me put this as a conjecture. So the conjecture is that uh, there exists a universal, in fact, it's for some reasons which I can't explain, uh, there exists a versal harmonic phi map to a building uh, from x tilde into some b, some building depending on phi. So this is only supposed to depend on the spectral curve. So it's only supposed to depend on this multi-value differential. But it's supposed to have this universal property, except it's only a versal property. Which is that if we have an actual map to a building obtained by that type of a condition, then it's supposed to factor. Uh, the difficulty here is that x has a real two dimensions. This guy for bigger groups has sort of an arbitrarily big dimension. So this can definitely not surject onto this guy. 
So on the points here, the many points here, which don't come from points here, there's no uniqueness here. I mean, uh, and you can actually construct uh, situations where you can see that there, you shouldn't expect a uniqueness of this map. Um, so that's why it's a versal guy. And so we could just show that in one particular case in our preprint. Um, so we, th well, we, we think this may be, a, so let's say maybe a pre-theorem in progress. Maybe a three theorem in progress in the SL3 case. And the SL3 case, but the idea is to, to kind of cheat anyway. Here we're cheating a lot, you might say, because we're using the fact that the tree is going to be a quotient of x. Okay. So the points in, tree, in the tree, we know what they are. They're leaves in, inside x. Here we maybe cheat a little bit, which is that there's actually, in the case of SL3, this has dimension 2, and this also has dimension 2. So this guy is actually going to cover you know, some percentage of the points here, you might say. I mean, it's going to cover some, some open sectors in, inside here. Uh, let me just finish by maybe the drawing of uh, what this actually looks like. In the, so, so this is a theorem in the BNR in the example, so, so CR preprint. Um, but let me just say what the homonic map looks like in this example. This example, we have the spectral curve has two different ramification points. And there's what's called a caustic line joining these two guys. This region inside here, that, and these are the Gyoto Mornitsky uh, spectral network curves. The, this region here, bounded by the Gyoto Mornitsky spectral curves, maps into here. The rest, of the, the rest of the picture actually maps down here. Okay. And this, uh, this whole thing maps into sort of an, an initial piece of a building. And the idea is that then you can fill it out to make an actual building. But the initial piece of the building is actually pretty easy to think of. You just take two sheets of paper and glue them together along this region. Okay. So let's just take two sheets of paper and glue them together along a region that looks like that. So just put some glue here and glue your two pieces of paper together. So they're not glued together down here, OK? And uh, this region here, it sort of folds over along this caustic line. And the, the stuff above here goes to the back sheet, and the stuff below here goes to the front sheet. Okay. So that's the example we know how to look at. Uh, and then based on what's going on here, you know, doing a several, trying to redo the proof a zillion times, uh, we think we may know how to see what to do uh, in the general case for SL3. So Is this compactification compatible with mirror symmetry in the sense that before compactification we can view Higgs bundles for group and Langlands dual as mirror pairs and what happens after compactification? I think basic mirror just changed uh, to be corrected by dual, but doesn't change the base of each. Yeah. My, I mean, my, my, you know, I don't understand this at all, obviously, but uh, my, my vague understanding is that we should actually somehow or other think, but I don't know how this is supposed to work, but somehow they're more think of this guy as being mirror dual to this guy. Is, is that? No, I think mirror dual is the representation of by one to mirror dual. That's it. Yeah. Ah, yeah. uh, uh, okay. Oh, so you think that if you do mirror dual here, then you should get a mirror dual here? I don't do mirror dual, mirror symmetry at all, and then he says, and just on the beta, yeah. But, uh, but then what happens over here? I mean. No, no, no actually, your symmetry is pretty clear here. You will have a twist of the and you put it in zero. But it's the case when the surface is compact. If you get punches, the story is more complicated. Yeah. No, it doesn't matter. It punches, does. you don't play your role. It's really easy. It does. You have attention to that. Well, the question is if mirror symmetry is spoiled by adding divisors of symmetry. Oh, that's it. Uh, uh, uh. 
what happens when, uh, uh, well, I think when you, I mean, I'm not sure, I think, uh, at least in some way, you can think of going from a symplectic guy to a Poisson guy, right? Is that, is that true? When you add the divisor and infinity? Maybe at least in, in, this, in, in this picture. Uh, Yeah, I remember just some time ago, just because you have, for the last thing you have promised that curve is too low dimensional, yeah? Is it possible to extend to some kind of high dimensional complex variety and go regular connections to? Ah. Uh, if, you, if you try to replace x by a higher dimensional variety? Yeah, or in the neighborhood of curve is high, high dimensional variety. Pure analytic equation. If you get regular connections, you can get. Uh, you mean try to do a try to look at a, just an analytic neighborhood of the curve? Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, uh, yeah, I see. I, I think I understand your your remark a little better. I, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, you know, the uh, the 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 real problem. I mean, the, certainly the real problem with this whole thing is that we don't have any way of saying what the points in the building, uh, uh, which are yeah. not touched by points of curves, yeah. should actually correspond to. Uh, and that's the real kind of a question here, which, uh, you know, in the tree case, you can say the points of the tree correspond to leaves, so there's some geometrical thing. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, and, and I think it's also this young, just remark, we try to understand what is how to calculate group DT invariance through this character variety. It's actually, it's, it leads to a very neat question. We should start with algebraic maps of C star to character variety. Uh -huh. Yeah, and this has the same. It gets some. Uh, New York break variety which has the same dimensions. Original character variety and uh -huh. and you some kind of break change of form. Uh, so you think that like sort of counting C stars inside here. Uh, uh, the, space, uh, space the space of C stars inside here. You group the numbers, lower the numbers, and it's variety has the same dimension as your character variety. Uh -huh. okay. And it maps in kind of two different ways. It gets some break change of coordinates, and uh, it's a bit DT invariance at the end of the day. You mean the two different ways are the two two endpoints some other? Or? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, two endpoints move for all like, two devices to infinity. Yeah. Yeah. So, so ah, and you're looking at C stars, so there's going to be two different points here. So, th so you're thinking of this? No, no. C star will. Uh, yeah, will connect two different points, but the interior of C star will be exactly inside character variety. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but so that's going to give you like a correspondence between the divisor and itself somehow there, uh, like a, maybe a Hecke type correspondence or something. Uh, yeah, no, just it's kind of neat question here too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Depending on the solution to the Okay, good. So, so we have a, now we have a correspondence between this divisor and itself, which is the moduli space of C stars mapping in two different ways to. Uh, More questions? Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, okay. Thank you.